you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Um, I, uh, well, I have a lot of co-authors up here, because uh, I'm going to talk about a, a set of results that have come from a, a sort of series of things I've been working on for a few years now. Um, and mostly what I'll talk about will be joint work with Greg Berkeleiko at Texas A&M, Graham Cox at Memorial University, and my colleague Shiza Kanzani at UNC. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about some structure of nodal lines and nodal sets that's worked with sort of Tom Beck, who's now at Fordham, but was a postdoc at UNC, Shiza, and a former undergraduate, actually, who discovered some interesting uh, properties of how nodal sets deform under boundary deformation uh, and some global impact of the of the structure of the boundary on on nodal sets. So um, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the problem of, of nodal domains and, and domain partitioning in general. Um, I'll try to talk about the structure of the of sort of the main ideas, the main theorems that will prove uh, uh, there's a notion of something that uh, the reason I chose this talk, I, I forgot to point out that this is going to be very much a spectral theory talk and not so much a, a relativity or propagation talk. That seeing the first several talks before me, I might have changed my mind about what to talk about had I known the schedule, but Alex and Alden and I had a conversation about a very similar project in the fall, and I thought this would be a good thing to discuss in front of them. So um, it is a bit of a deviation. There will be no radio point estimates or propagation of singularities. Um, but there will be some classic elliptic theory, which Semyon definitely uh, uh, introduced a bit of. So, um, and some interesting properties of Sobolev spaces uh, on domains with 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 with, with singular stratum. Um, so, what's the idea? I'm interested in how much an eigenfunction, let's say, of the Laplacian in general. I'll focus on that in this talk. But of course, most all of this will apply to general second-order elliptic operators. And it's uh, on R d some bounded domain. Uh, uh, with, uh, we'll have, a, of course, an ordered spectrum um, with a simple first eigenvalue and uh, a series of eigenvalues increasing off to infinity. And the eigenfunctions, it, it, here I don't so much care about the boundary conditions on the outer boundary. They could be Dirichlet or Neumann, they could be mixed, they could be Rabban, they could be uh, anything that gives me a self-adjoint extension of the Laplacian and a discrete spectrum. Uh, the outer boundary conditions don't matter too much from what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, in particular, this notion of sturm liouville theory is about analyzing how much these eigenfunctions quote unquote oscillate, namely how many connected regions of uniform sign do these eigenfunctions partition a domain into. Okay, Oops, my apologies. Okay, so the nodal domains of that eigenfunction are connected components of the set where the eigenfunction is non-zero. Um, the total number of nodal domains via a sort of Rayleigh-Ritz type argument is relatively easily seen uh, to be the order in which the eigenfunction presented itself. So the, the kth eigenfunction has at most k nodal domains, and that's an old theorem due to Courant. And so that means there's this notion of what we call nodal deficiency, which is the difference between the maximum possible amount of oscillation and the amount that an eigenfunction actually oscillates. Okay. And uh, it's known that in one dimension, this is always zero, okay? And in higher dimensions, this is only zero for a finite number of k's. It's in fact always non-zero for above a certain energy threshold. And a uh, little beyond that is actually known. There are a handful of very symmetric examples like tori and triangles and spheres and so forth where the top order current sharp which is when this, the last k for which this is zero is known, but otherwise it's a very uh, complicated question. Okay. But there was an interesting formula derived for that quantity, that delta, the nodal deficiency, by Greg, one of my co-authors, Berkeleiko, and his colleagues, Peter Kuchman and Uli Smolensky, um, in a paper in 2012, where they gave that nodal deficiency as the index of the, of the Hessian, of a variation of the space of partitions. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we get forward, so don't dwell on that too much. It's, but it's a very, you can imagine this is a complicated manifold of ways to partition a domain. But in the certain setting where you had a simple eigenfunction and a smooth nodal set, 
they were able to define a manifold structure, do a variation over that, and prove that the Hessian of that variation had index equal exactly to delta, okay? A few years later, Graham Cox, my other co-author, and my other colleague, Chris Jones, wrote a paper where we gave a condition on the nodal deficiency in terms of the spectrum of a, a, a version of a Dirichlet to Neumann operator defined on the nodal set. I say version, so let me just draw a quick picture. Sort of draw the simplest picture I can possibly imagine. And here I have two uh, components of the eigenfunction. And the Dirichlet to Neumann map that I'm interested in is on the separating surface, the nodal set. And, but the Dirichlet to Neumann map who, that we studied is actually, there are two Dirichlet to Neumann maps. If I put Dirichlet boundary conditions on this line, of course I've got the Dirichlet to Neumann map from solving the elliptic problem in the right half and restricting to the boundary for the Neumann data, and of course solving from the left half. And so our Dirichlet to Neumann map is the sum of both of these. We call it a two-sided Dirichlet to Neumann map, okay? It comes from analyzing the, the Neumann trace of the Dirichlet solution to the problem uh, uh, into each component of the nodal domains, okay? And what we said is, <clears throat> I'll write this theorem down uh, a bit more carefully later, but our theorem is that the, the Morse index, the number of negative eigenvalues of this operator defined on this partition space, is exactly also equal to delta. Okay? And what we've been working on recently is understanding precisely why those two things are equal to each other and actually discovering the analytic structure by which you see that they are the same. And in doing so, it gives some insight into other interesting partitioning problems on domains, okay? So what is uh, the, a related problem? So for those, I think everyone here knows very well uh, the notion of eigenfunctions, but you may be less familiar with the notion of partitioning domains or spectral partitioning. Well, one way to think about partitioning a domain is to divide it up into components, let's say a K partition, would be given by choosing k subdomains, on those k subdomains assigning Dirichlet boundary conditions, such that the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, by Dirichlet eigenvalue I mean the eigenvalue with boundary conditions on d omega, whatever they were originally, and Dirichlet, eigen, Dirichlet condition on that dividing set, is all equal. That's, a that's the family of Ecchi partitions, okay? So that means that 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 eigenvalue, you can think of as a, uh, as a, as a value on that partition that you, that, you, that you give. And you can ask, is it possible to now vary over the set of K partitions to find a minimal value of that partition energy lambda one, okay? And it turns out if you get to a minimal value or even a critical value of that, there is underlying structure of that partition set as the nodal domain in the case where, uh, uh, in certain cases where, the, uh, where you have a bipartite structure of the partition, it's actually the nodal domain of an eigenfunction. And otherwise, in two dimensions, it can be seen as the nodal domain of a magnetic Schrodinger operator, which is a beautiful result of Helfair and collaborators that I'll talk about a little bit more later as well, okay? Um, so, but it's under using this framework by looking at this notion of partition space that the berkeleyko kuchmitz smolansky result was done. Like I said, they described some smooth Hilbert manifold structure on the space of Ecchi partitions, and then they looked analytically nearby at, uh, 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 crit at, at critical part you know, the, the structure of the domain for critical elements of this, uh, of this lambda one function, okay? And, uh, uh, all right. So like I said, the, the one goal could be uh, to take the, you could also consider uh, spectrally minimal, minimal partitions, which is instead of looking over the space of Ecchi partitions, you can divide into partitions omega j to omega one to omega k. Look at the maximum of all 
Dirichlet eigenvalues on those domains. And it turns out that if you look for the minimum of that over the space of K partitions, it will be an Ecchi partition, okay? Um, and there are various works that prove that, uh, many works by Helfer. Um, uh, there's a, 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 one of the results that maybe has the, the strongest statement is by Helfer, Hoffman, Osterhoff, and Terracini, but there's also work by Helfer, Hoffman, Osterhoff, Hoffman, Osterhoff, who established various versions of this. And a lot of this is done in two dimensions, um, a lot of the examples that I'll show you will be in two dimensions, but I do want to point out as I'm moving along that um, the main theorems that we have will apply in any dimension. Uh, it's just easier to visualize some things and to make some, uh, to learn some things from what we've done in certain two dimensional examples. Okay. So like I said, our result was, uh, was that this nodal deficiency parameter, delta, which I'll just remind you is the difference between the maximum possible amount of oscillation and the actual oscillation of the eigenfunction. We wrote down, our original theorem had a slight shift to it. So we didn't want to deal with the fact that of course, at an eigenvalue, so I should, I should point out uh, that when I say the Dirichlet's Neumann map, I'm looking at the elliptic operator is shifted by the corresponding eigenvalue at which I'm computing this eigenfunction, okay? So these Dirichlet to Neumann maps, as I mentioned them, they, I should point out, they implicitly depend on the value of lambda that you're at. And the point was, is, is, you know, if you've played around with Dirichlet's Neumann maps, you know that those are not uh, necessarily, they have a, a kernel if you're at a Dirichlet eigenvalue. We didn't exactly want to deal with uh, uh, non-invertible operators, so we looked at an energy slightly above the energy of the eigenvalue that we were considering. And what we showed is for simple eigenvalues, the negative index of this two-sided Dirichlet's Neumann map that I mentioned to you exactly equals the nodal deficiency. Well, then we got a little smarter, and we realized we, that the kernel is really not so much of an obstruction. And uh, thanks in part to Graham and the work of uh, Graham, Greg, and Helfer and Sundquist, we have a version of this that's now stronger, and it says, even if I have a higher multiplicity eigenvalue, pick a representation of the eigenfunction whose nodal deficiency you want to study, and its nodal deficiency is one minus the dimension of the kernel, so the, 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 the dimensionality of the multiplicity space, plus the two-sided Dirichlet to Neumann map Morse index, okay? So all this does uh, is introduce some, uh, 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 just a shift. And of course you see, if I have a simple eigenvalue, this is one and the formula matches up. So I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick with focusing on a, a cases where I'm interested in sort of simple eigenvalues to avoid this shift. But I just want to make sure you're aware that higher multiplicity eigenvalues fit into this machinery very well. Okay. Um, and like I said, as I mentioned before, I want to point out that both the operator with which I extend and then take the trace to define my Dirichlet Neumann maps and of course the eigenfunction are all very dependent on the energy where I'm at. Okay. Alex asked me the question as to whether or not we could eventually do this, write a similar statement where we use the original Dirichlet to Neumann map that does not depend on lambda and the answer is not in any way that I know at the moment. It doesn't matter which one you choose. It, it will have a given nodal deficiency and the one you choose could have a different nodal deficiency, but this statement will still hold true because these will differ based on the choice that you make. The, the index of the, of the two-sided Dirichlet to Neumann map will depend on the nodal set that that phi star picks out. Thank you. And so, yes, yeah, so in particular, if you think about this problem on the square, which is something that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, you have lots of degeneracy, right? You have lots of multiplicity two eigenvalues, and you can vary nodal sets very, very broadly, even at the same energy. Um, but the formula still works. Okay, so originally, uh, Graham, Chris, and I uh, realized that this Dirichlet to Neumann map arose quite naturally using some uh, 
I would say, very high-tech machinery that we were implementing using sort of a Maslow index over a family of uh, solutions to elliptic problems. So we were developing a Maslow framework in infinite dimensional Banach spaces, and we were able to derive our formula for delta. But Greg, uh, being sort of more trained in uh, a lot of the mathematical physics that many people here know very well, pointed out to us that we can actually simplify the way in which our index theorem arises very naturally using a, a very classical spectral flow argument. So let me just point out how that works. What we're going to do is we're going to take our, our uh, elliptic operator, let's just make it very simply a, a Schrodinger operator, say minus Laplacian plus potential. And I'm going to make a family of those operators parameterized by some sigma, which is going to range from zero to infinity. And the way in which it introduces, the way in which sigma manifests itself is as a, it introduces effectively a Robin-like boundary condition on the partition, okay? And uh, so if sigma is zero, what we realize is because of course the normal derivative pointing to the right is negative, the normal derivative pointing to the left, this is just a continuity condition in the normal derivative. I have continuity also at, as, a, as a constraint. And so this, if you look at this in 1D, you would write this down and you would say, oh, I've exactly put a delta function potential at the partition point in a 1D example. And in higher dimensions, what we think of this is, is effectively as like a delta function on a separating hypersurface. Yeah. Um, okay, so now you vary. You take sigma equals zero, and you realize that's equivalent to the original elliptic operator and its, its domain. And now as you increase, what you will realize is that all the eigenvalues increase. I will, I will give a very simple proof of that a little bit later. And that... As those eigenvalues increase, if sigma uh, uh, is an eigenvalue of this two-sided two dirichlet Neumann map, it's equivalent to the original eigenvalue being an eigenvalue of the shifted Laplacian, right? Now, why is that? Well, <laughs> that's because you will have gotten something in the spectrum at exactly lambda star, or plus epsilon if you did the shift, okay, where this condition was satisfied. But this is exactly the Steklov eigenvalue condition for the dirichlet Neumann map. And we say it's two-sided because the original Steklov eigenvalue would not have, you know, it would only depend on one normal derivative, but the two-sided depends on the sum. Okay? And I mentioned, um, I will give you a theorem later, I'm focusing for this example on, on eigenfunctions, but like I said, we can deal with this for general partitions. And there's a, the nice thing about general partitions is that Ecchi partitions, in particular critical Ecchi partitions, you can realize that these two uh, they, there can be an anti-matching condition that you put on the normal derivative, so all you have to do is introduce an orientation shift and you get a similar spectral flow. That was, it. That was something that Helfer and Sundqvist developed in 2D for magnetic Schrodinger operators and has, we've now generalized to more general partitions. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you realize that you get exactly uh, a Steklov eigenvalue if you, if you cross and... Uh, <clears throat> If you, and the, let's think about what happens. Uh, I'm gonna show you a picture later, but I think sometimes it's easy to, easier to see it being drawn. So what happens is that some of these eigenvalues will converge to lambda star and some might cross, okay? And what happens is that at lambda star, if you go back to this and you think about what happens as sigma goes to infinity, is that this effectively becomes a Dirichlet boundary condition. And that's actually true, that's what's happening, is this is becoming a Dirichlet boundary condition on that partition set. Well, it's great. so each component of my original eigenfunction is now a ground state eigenfunction of a Dirichlet problem, which we know is simple, right? So the number of things that converge to lambda star, that equals exactly the number of nodal domains, right? The number of things that crossed, those are exactly indices of the two-sided Dirichlet Neumann map. And the number that I actually started with are exactly k, things below lambda star. Okay, that's the, that's 
in a nutshell, the idea behind the spectral flow proof. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this is a picture of that for a couple of instances that we did numerically. Um, so on the left, this is in the setting of a nice uh, quantum graph where we could explicitly uh, compute these things. And, uh, uh, um, and on, the, on the right, it's the case of a rectangle. Um, and here you see I'm only going to pi over 2 because we, I plotted arc tan of sigma instead of sigma. Okay. So here you would see uh, we started with uh, k was equal to 4, and I had two crossings. Okay. And here I have one, two, three crossings. Okay. So that's gonna that 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 those crossings exactly correspond to the index of my two-sided Dirichlet Neumann map, and they exactly correspond to the nodal deficiency. There's a little bit of work to prove that those are equal, that there's monotonicity, that nothing's left over, but it's not too bad. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> one thing that we're that we're interested in, um, and I'll give you a little flavor of this on the rectangle is are there any geometric intuitive properties about the eigenfunction that would tell me what this number should be, okay? In general, uh, the answer is, is it's, that's a hard problem. However, on the rectangle, it's actually got a really beautiful solution. So if I take a separable elliptic operator on the rectangle, um, so everything, you know, let's just fix the Laplacian, that's probably the easiest. Um, then I can consider the, you know, if I think about the spectrum of a separable elliptic operator on a, a rectangle, well, that's a lattice point problem. So the spectrum, it separates out into, you know, sums of, of squares of the spectrum of each individual separable component. And so I can put the eigenvalues on a lattice and I can discover, I can think about the energy shell of the two-dimensional problem as being just the ellipse that lives at a certain intersection point with one of those lattice point problems, or one of those lattice points. And so, on a, so here on the left, I showed you a picture of a simple eigenvalue, okay? Because this energy shell doesn't intersect any other points on the lattice. And on the right, I showed you an example of a multiplicity two eigenvalue because I both have the energy shell intersecting here and here, okay? Now what's remarkable on the rectangle is that if you think about oscillation of eigenfunctions, you have oscillation in the vertical and the horizontal. And uh, it's not too hard maybe to convince yourself that, uh, that exactly the, the amount of oscillation that I'm missing is equal to the objects that are contained outside this rectangle and inside the shell. Now, why is that? It's because here, I'm sort of oscillating too much in the, in the horizontal direction, and here I'm oscillating too much in the vertical direction. Okay. Uh, so what the two theorems that we have tell us, or you know, uh, the, the, the concept that you, you can convince yourself that the nodal deficiency is exactly equal to the number of dots you should see in, those, in the complement of this ellipse and the rectangle. What are, what, and our theorem tells us once you convince yourself that's the nodal deficiency, that that equals the index of the two-sided Dirichlet Neumann map. And then what we did with Graham and Greg in our first paper um, in Letters of Math Physics was to actually prove not only that that's, we know that quantitatively, but that if I use some quantitative information on the spectral flow, it's exactly these eigenvalues that are flowing, beyond, that, are, that are crossing as in my picture here. So not only is the count correct, these are the ones that are directly responsible for the crossings that we observe in the spectral flow argument. That's a very special geometric consideration. For non-separable problems, you get a lot more complicated features. In particular, uh, you can get things like avoided crossings, okay? And for the physicists, uh, or those trained in mathematical physics, there's a lore theorem which says if you have an avoided crossing, then what's happening is that this branch of the eigenfunction is still transferring its properties geometrically to this branch of the eigenfunction. And in general, you see that's true. What you should imagine is there's probably some parameter you could vary in to make a sheet where there is actually a crossing happening here at a nearby complicated manifold space. Okay, so, so, but then what you should say is, well, the oscillation properties should probably actually have come from here 
even though that's not the branch that's crossing, this is the branch that's crossing, and things get very complicated. So long story short is understanding a geometric signature of the eigenfunction and how it should inform which uh, or what the nodal deficiency should be can be a very complicated question. Okay. So how am I doing on time? Uh, I guess I have about 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a few slides here on the rectangle, um, but... Uh, I'm actually going to talk about most of what I want to say for that, and so I'm going to go ahead and, and skip ahead uh, uh, to, the, to the, just analyzing the spectral flow. Um, and so I want to consider uh, a Schrodinger operator, okay? And now this is actually something, for those of you who are interested in uh, classical elliptic theory with rough boundaries, um, you might be interested in some open questions that we have here. Um, I want to consider this all I, so the outer domain, omega, I can, all I need uh, is that I, I have enough to generate a, a well-defined spectrum that with, with regular eigenfunctions. So I have very minimal constraints on the domain omega. I'm going to consider, let's say, Dirichlet boundary conditions, although like I said, that doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to take an eigenfunction uh, and define its nodal set to be gamma. So how do I now think about proving some of these properties? How do, I, how do I prove this picture that I sort of cartoon drew over there for you? Well, the way to do it is to think about the family of operators that I defined for you really as a family of Dirichlet forms, OK? And what you realize is that, the, so it's very easy to see how sort of positivity arises for this, because what you realize is the Dirichlet form for that model operator that I gave you is exactly a correction sigma times an integral over the set on which I've defined my, my complicated boundary condition. Um, and now this gives me a form parameterization of the spectrum uh, uh, for this operator L sigma, okay? And then things such as the monotonicity uh, and various properties uh, hold. So one thing you can prove is that, again, if epsilon is sufficiently small, then minus sigma is exactly an eigenvalue of the two-sided Dirichlet Neumann map if and only if uh, uh, the spectrum of the sigma operator equals uh, lambda star plus, plus epsilon. Um, you can also, uh, uh, when you, you can prove that these curves are, are analytic, uh, and you can say that uh, these eigenvalue curves give rise to a negative eigenvalue. Uh, 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 this is just a, a restatement of what it means to be a Dirichlet, uh, to be a Steklov eigenvalue. Um, and uh, uh, so from the theorem we know that, or from the lemma, we know that this is an if and only if statement, right? That, that really the, the, the crossings correspond precisely to eigenvalues of the two-sided Dirichlet Neumann map and vice versa. Um, and that's what, that's what gives us that the full count uh, uh, has this monotonicity to it. And, uh, and we know that, that, that Let's, that gamma k of zero is uh, in the gamma k of sigma is increasing out to gamma k of infinity. Okay, and so you really uh, uh, only need to check the endpoints, and that's that's what gives us the count. Okay. Um, in particular, we can show, and so how do I? What's one key aspect of that? One key aspect of that is proving that if I cross before infinity, I cross with positive slope. I don't want to, I, I, I really want to show that if I cross, I actually cross, okay? So that's, and that turns out to be a very, very elegant and simple statement. It tells you that if you, that the derivative of the eigenvalue at that time is exactly equal to the integral over the partition set of the square of the eigenfunction. But, of course, if that were zero, then you would actually have been an original eigenfunction, and you would not have come from the original problem. And uh, this, so there's an existence of an analytic curve, uh, even for multiplicity, higher multiplicity eigenvalues using, you know, the works of Kato, for instance. Okay. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, now that we have this ordered set of the, uh, of the eigenvalues as a function of the spectral flow parameter sigma, uh, we can consider uh, how they converge at infinity and indeed 
the, uh, since lambda star is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue and hence is simple on each of its nodal domains, this can only have multiplicity exactly equal to the number of nodal domains, okay? All right. So that tells me that <clears throat> there are gonna be a certain number of spectral values that converge to lambda star and a certain number that are larger than lambda star. Um, and like I said, if lambda star is simple, then this gives us exactly the theorem. And again, just because we, we, we were being a bit naive early on, we did this where I didn't just look at lambda star, I looked at it at a bit of a shift, okay? Um, and like I said, if it is indeed higher multiplicity, then we just have to uh, understand, we do define K star as sort of the minimum uh, uh, lambda N such that lambda N equals lambda star. And then uh, for that, uh, uh, we, for all eigenvalues, lambda less than or equal to lambda star, uh, we have that uh, uh, k star minus one plus the dimension of the kernel will give me the eigenvalues. Okay. So I, again, I had uh, 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 some slides on what happens, how we can do this for the rectangle in the separable problem by considering spectral flow for 1D operators. I'm uh, going to uh, also um, go ahead and move to some of the meteor theorems that I've got and, uh, and just say, this is a paper that Graham, Tom, and I wrote with some students where we we're able to explicitly characterize the spectral flow eigenvalues for operators of this type, excuse me, um, uh, 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 in the case where I have no potential. And, and again, I like pointing out the 1D example because it, it's just, you, if you've ever worked with a delta function, you can see immediately this is just introducing a delta function potential shift of an elliptic operator. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, uh, and skip ahead just to that statement, um, which is, as may or may not surprise those of you who've thought about uh, these kinds of 1D transcendental problems, we actually can completely characterize the spectrum uh, uh, of the spectral flow operator for all sigma. Graham, Greg, and I did it at infinity and zero. We were actually able to do it for all sigma and get a fully, uh, a full explicit representation of the, of the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. And you can use that to very explicitly prove that the dots that I pointed to on the lattice are exactly the ones that escape uh, and, and that those are the only ones that escape, the energy shock. All right, so that's kind of a, an overview of the spectral flow. The spectral flow plays sort of a, a background role in the last sort of main theorems that I wanna to present to you in the, in the sense that the spectral flow tells us something about the nodal deficiency, okay? I will remind you that Helfer and Sundquist and also Greg Graham, Helfer and Sundquist have generalized the spectral flow to not just uh, uh, acting on partitions from eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but also more general partitions, okay? And so there's also this notion of the fact that the nodal deficiency comes from a, a variation over the manifold of partitions. And so the next theorems that I wanna to present to you give you the beautiful analytic framework for connecting those two points of view, okay? So what's the theorem? I have a, it's a, it, the theorem is long and I apologize for that. And there's some notation that I haven't quite introduced here yet, which I'm gonna try to write on the board, but I wanna give the, the gist, okay? So what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take a, a critical equipartition, okay? So remember, these are related to these uh, spectral partitioning problems, uh, but this is now a, a part, a, an equipartition. So all the Dirichlet eigenvalues in each component are equal and it's critical which means it's uh, uh, that if I vary over that family of Becky partitions, this is a local, local minimum, okay? Now, this space ESP, what is it, okay? It is a subspace of the space of diffeomorphisms on the partition space that are at least HS that fix P, okay? So what am I gonna try to do? I'm gonna try to push the partition with the diffeomorphism, okay? I'm gonna want that diffeomorphism to be sufficiently smooth, okay? HS for S bigger than dimension plus three over two. That's kind of a technicality because it allows us to take enough derivatives to do second variations, okay? Uh, over that family of diffeomorphisms, I have a map 
of the eigenvalue over that Ecchi partition space, remember that's just the eigenvalue in each domain, into R. And now, if I think about the unit normal vector along the, I'm sorry, I changed from gamma to sigma, so sigma is now the partition set, okay? And um, <clears throat> right now, this original theorem that we proved in 2022, I'm assuming that it's a smooth partition set. I'm assuming no self-interactions, no corners, okay? So this one would be allowed, okay? But another interesting partition of the circle that's believed to be minimal but not known to be universally minimal is the so-called Mercedes star partition. You can see this is not bipartite, right? Because I go negative, positive, positive, right? I can't, or negative. So uh, uh, we, but in a, this can be written as an eigenstate of one of these partition Laplacians that I mentioned. And so we want to be able to handle things like this. We cannot with this theorem, but in the theorem that will hopefully appear later this summer, we can, and I'll, I'll point that out, okay? So originally, so let's, let's start in the smooth case. And then what did we say? Well, it turns out that if you do the variation, first of all, you need some manifold structure on ES. So that's part of a theorem that we have to prove, that there's an underlying smooth manifold structure on ES, okay? And with respect to that manifold structure, if you take the Hessian of that energy, lambda, it can be written as a quadratic form. And that quadratic form is generated precisely by the two-sided Dirichlet minimum. So you see that this Hessian, which is exactly the berkeleyko kuchman smolensky theorem, is a similarity transformation of R index, okay? Now, why do I say similarity? Because you see these rows in here, okay? What is rho? Rho is a multiple of the normal derivative of the Dirichlet eigenfunction restricted to that component of the boundary which should make sense, because if I want to even understand what this operator is, I have to be orthogonal to those objects to have a well-defined space, okay? Okay, so what does that mean? It means the index of the Hessian over this space is exactly sort of, a, again, like a similarity transformation acting on precisely our two-sided Dirichlet. Okay. So that's awesome. Uh, at least we were excited about it. Um, because we finally understood why these two things are so intimately linked. And uh, <clears throat> so let me just give a picture of why this could even be useful in the smooth case to understand other types of partitions. Uh, I'm going to emphasize that what I'm going to state right now is sort of at a very early conjectural stage, but... Let's think about the rectangle. And uh, <clears throat> let's take the, a simple eigenfunction that partitions that rectangle into three domains, okay? Easy to write down what this is. And <clears throat> now let's think about what the, the corresponding eigenvalues of the Dirichlet, of the two-sided Dirichlet to Neumann map would be on this, which may look complicated, but in fact, either using some symmetry considerations or that formula that I gave you for 1D separable operators, you can write that down. And what it turns out is that you realize this is not minimal, that Hessian has negative eigenvalues, and that those negative eigenvalues point you in a direction. Let me grab a colored chalk to point out that the, that the Hessian would, de would tell you that the energy would decrease if you move in a direction like this, okay? So what does that suggest? Well, it suggests, this is where the conjecture part comes in, that there's maybe a nearby local minimal partition that would have some form that looks like that. And in fact, numerically, we've now found a minimal partition that looks like that. Um, so we're hoping that using this point of view, you can actually start to think about finding minimal partitions by using, to some extent, uh, a notion of a flow through partition space, and that you should initiate that flow along the direction suggested precisely by this negative index. And that negative index 
at least in certain cases, you can now understand, because it's much easier to compute eigenfunctions of Dirichlet's Norman maps than it is to compute the Hessian of a complicated, very high dimensional manifold over partition spaces, okay? Okay, so uh, what are my, so the other theorems, so, so this theorem has appeared in uh, calculus variations in PDE last year. Our current theorems, um, which are with uh, sort of the, the, the partition team as well as Peter Kutschmann, um, we have a few. So one is that let's take this partition as a bipartite K partition, but now allow it to have corners, allow intersections, okay? Following our equivalent, this looks a lot, if you've read Helfair's work, this looks a lot like a theorem you would see in their work, okay? P locally minimizes the, the, the partition energy. P is a minimal partition. Uh, that means it, minimal with respect to that, that Eki partition energy. And it's the nodal partition of a current sharp eigenfunction. <clears throat> the current sharpness comes because I put bipartite in the assumptions, okay? So what's important about that? Well, uh, this tells me, uh, again, a relationship between the, the, the notion of being a minimal partition, uh, the notion of the, of the partition energy and the, uh, and the underlying relationship to the Laplacian eigenfunction structure. Now, <clears throat> but that's not the whole story because we can also consider, I mentioned that, that there are these magnetic Schrodinger operators that played a role in describing minimal partitions. Well, in higher dimensions, we can define what we think of as these partition Laplacians, which are very much like uh, the regular Laplacian, but now on the partition, you define sort of anti-matching conditions, both in Dirichlet and in Neumann. I'll remind you, since these normal derivatives point in different directions, this is an anti-matching Neumann condition, okay? So if you happen to be on a bipartite partition, this, it turns out, is unitarily equivalent to the Laplacian. Same spectrum, okay, which you want. If it is not, it allows you to have anti-matching conditions, which going back to what I told you about how the normal derivatives have to be multiples of one another is exactly the condition for describing minimal partitions, okay? So now, if I'm just a general K partition with corners, I have a very similar theorem, but now <clears throat> I realize that that minimal partition arises as a nodal partition precisely of a current sharp eigenfunction for the partition Laplacian. Okay. Um, again, let me show you a picture where this is kind of, uh, this gives some insight. So um, I'm vying for us to call this the uh, trivial pursuit partition. For those of you who used to play this game uh, when they were kids, uh, if you're, uh, let's say, over 35, maybe. Um, and uh, uh, you could ask, is this minimal? Okay, the answer is no, it's not minimal. So I wanna point out, I'm gonna uh, show you a, a key construction. I, I wanna uh, uh, quickly point out some structure in the, uh, sorry, in the theorem, because what it turns out, you could worry about what's happening at this crossing and whether or not in this family of diffeomorphisms that I'm pointing out to you, you need to open the crossing to actually explore the full negative set of, of, of indices, right? The negative indices over partition space could want to open that point, okay? But what we prove, because of the very special structure of the space H1 half in 1D or H1 in 2D, is that you can actually, you can decrease the energy in all the directions that the Hessian tells you to decrease in while preserving exactly this crossing. So actually what we end up with is this is not minimal, but we now have a new proposed minimal six partition. It looks like this. And we can describe what this is numerically and find exactly structures that suggest that it works. Um, this is a, 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 so we would propose that this could be the candidate for a minimal six partition, and this is merely a critical point of the partition space, okay? Um, in order to do all of this, like I said, you need some manifold structure, you need ideas of tangent spaces over that manifold structure, you need, you need differentiability with respect to diffeomorphisms of that manifold structure. But once you have all that, really what this is, what a big 
uh, uh, contribution that we hopefully will have added in all of this is to write down a simple uh, interior Hadamard variation form for both the first and the second variation that writes everything on the interior as a div divergence form operator. And that actually finding that structure in general with respect to this family of perturbations was quite a challenge in and of itself, but is absolutely crucial to all the proofs, okay? And I think that I'm roughly running out of time. So as I expected, I only got to talk to you about uh, uh, partitions. Um, and I do hope that this paper will appear this summer. Um, but I will very, very quickly show you a picture that will advertise some other work that I've been doing, which is about analyzing not the number of nodal domains, but the properties of nodal sets, and analyzing how a nodal set varies over a boundary deformation. And uh, the cool thing, I'll just show you one picture, is that uh, if I deform an interior crossing, what we end up with are very precise estimates on how that crossing opens. So basically, what it turns out is that interior crossings are very highly symmetric objects, and you break this symmetry whatsoever, even far away, and you will get a very strong breaking of that interior crossing. So, so high oscillations are extremely hard to come by in high energy eigenfunctions, is sort of the long story short. Um, and this is work that Tom and I did, and we really give, uh, if this perturbation is of order eta, the new opening is of order square root eta, no matter what the aspect ratio is here of the rectangle. And that's sort of really what the strength of the theorem is, that it feels, these, it feels the boundary, the, high, the opening feels the boundary very, very globally, no matter how far away you put it from the boundary deformation. Okay. So this tells you that under a small boundary deformation, this went from having uh, uh, oscill four oscillations to having three oscillations in a uniform fashion. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, for the invitation to give a talk. <laughs>